over the last 18 months, equities have been witnessing a volatile phase owing to the liquidity tightening measures announced by central bankers to combat inflation. Three factors drive stock markets. Valuations, expected growth in corporate earnings, and liquidity. Currently, valuations look attractive if trailing Nifty 50 PE is referred to as it stands at around 20. Second factor, expected growth in earnings is highly optimistic as economy is in full momentum currently. Only the third factor, which is liquidity, is unfavorable and is the reason for the consolidation which domestic equities are witnessing. Given that two core factors, that is trailing valuations and expected earnings are positive, the fall in the market is an opportunity for investors. As in the long term, what matters most is investing at fair valuations and in good businesses that experience future growth. But it just sounds easy and even experienced fund managers fail to create good returns during tough phases of markets like the past 18 months. So how have experienced fund managers observed the year 2022 and what can investors take away from the recent learnings for the times ahead? On that note, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the panelists of our first session who will discuss on driving 2023 towards alpha generation in equities through learnings of 2022. And now is the time that I introduce you all to our panelists. Our first panelist is Mr. Samir Arora. He is the founder and fund manager at Helios Capital. From 1998 to 2003, he was the head of Asian Emerging Markets at Alliance Capital Management in Singapore. From 1993 to August 2003, Samir was the Chief Investment Officer of Alliance Capital's Indian Mutual Fund business and along with managing Alliance Capital's Asian Emerging Markets mandates, managed all of Alliance Capital's India dedicated equity funds. Our next panelist is Mr. Sunil Singhania. He is the founder of Abacus Asset Management. Prior to this, in his role as Global Head of Equities at Reliance Capital Limited, he oversaw equity assets and provided strategic inputs across Reliance Capital Group of companies, including asset management, insurance, AIF, and offshore assets. And as CIO equities, he led Reliance Mutual Fund equity schemes to be rated amongst the best. Reliance growth grew over times in less than 22 years under his leadership. Our next panelist is Mr. Samit, Samit Vartak. Samit Vartak is the founding partner and chief investment officer of Sage One Investment Managers. He has worked closely with various companies in the US and India, advising them on business strategy, profit optimization, growth, and valuation. This experience forms the backbone that helps him better understand businesses and their fair value. He has been early in identifying and investing in multiple businesses across industries before they catch market attention. Samit actively shares his knowledge and learnings through widely followed investor newsletters, lectures at CFA, society, industry, forums, with schools and media interviews. Our moderator for the session is Mr. Kamal Manocha, who is founder and CEO at PMS AIF World. He's responsible for driving the overall business across both wealth management as well as content management. Over past four years, PMS AIF World has conceptualized various innovations under his capable thought leadership. The most recent one being the quality, risk and consistency framework created to deep dive the space of portfolio management services. Kamal brings with him 18 years of experience, holds a master's degree in management and a bachelor's degree in economics from Hansraj College, Delhi University, and many more investment certifications. Over to you, Mr. Manocha. Thank you so much, Akriti. And welcome everyone. It gives me immense pleasure 
to convey that you know this is the second day of this fourth annual summit we have named this summit as resurgence of the golden bird for india and we are quite you know bullish and optimistic about this decade and in that context you know here i am to kind of fulfill my responsibility towards our clients in terms of getting them realistic answers from the experienced fund managers especially during the tough period when over the last 18 months investors have not made much returns so uh, you know akriti was talking about a panel thought leader panel with experienced fund managers we have three fund managers with you know three decades of experience uh, you know uh, with samir with samir arora two two and a half decades of experience with sunil singhania and close to two decades of experience with samit vartak so obviously you know we are going to add lot of value and i would want to begin with uh, mr samir arora by first asking him that till 2022 november you know all of us were quite happy seeing that indian equity markets have actually performed better than us and china and obviously you know we were kind of i was reading this i think your article had also mentioned once that we have been kind of ahead of them and that conveys that uh, next decade definitely belongs to india and that is why india has corrected less but over last 3 months china is up by around 30% us has also recovered but in india you know we have further lower confidence with regards to investors especially you know the, the recent news of a us company you know which came for our one of the largest company so you know how do you see 2023 after tough 2022 in the current context in the you know uh, in this parlance thank you very much but i think uh, it is too short a period to suddenly become uh, negative on the fact that for one month india has underperformed or even two three months but you can't have it both ways for saying that last year till november we were celebrating that we were outperforming and then also separately saying that the market has had a tough 18 months because we haven't in absolute uh, made money as a market the point is that in a big picture sense even when india was not at such a relatively strong position relative to the world for the last 20 years and 25 years and even 10 years india has really outperformed nearly everybody over 10 years it has underperformed us but over 20 and 25 it has even done that so going forward if we start from here and we look at india's relative position in the world relative to the big money drawing centers which might be china or us or europe india definitely is in a good place again but i am just saying that you can't take one month relative view and say that this despondency has to continue so for example if after the satyam debacle infosys and satyam prior to that were trading at some 30 40% discount says satyam was trading to infosys and then there was a problem and then satyam fell 80% and then for the next 3 months it may have gone up 50% doesn't mean that you will question infosys for those 2 months i look at china in the same way it fell so much for its own issues for macro issues for its own policies that a rebound from there is not something that threatens india in a relative position sense it's too short a period to worry over time india has done well and there's no reason why it will do less well than what it has done in the past uh, long term period which is 20 25 years in the range of 13 to 15% per annum at the index level in rupee terms sure samir i think you know uh, the experience brings the bigger picture and that is exactly what is the intent of this panel discussion to kind of reassure investors moving on to uh, mr sunil singhania so you know uh, there have been lot of headwinds in the past 18 months be it rise in interest rates inflation you know recessionary fears after now 18 months of correction uh, you know do you see some of these headwinds are turning into tailwinds and india is actually in the position to capitalize in the current scenario good morning and thanks for having me here uh... so you know two parts to the question whether the uh, headwinds are turning into tailwinds i think absolutely right and when i say that i mean the global headwinds turning into tailwinds so obviously in 22 you had uh, you know uh, inflation go through the roof obviously post russia ukraine war uh, you had the commodity prices shoot up almost 100% uh, 
uh, you also had uh, energy cost, whether it was oil, gas, uh, coal, and so on and so forth, go through the roof. And I think consequently, you had inflation, uh, which uh, touched multi-decade highs. And central banks all over the world, uh, uh, you know, were obviously increasing interest rates like never before, with U.S. having four continuous interest rate hikes of 75 basis points each. On top of it, you had a very strict uh, China uh, zero COVID policy, which uh, scuttled growth in China and also led to disruptions uh, in supply chains all over the world. And to that extent, I think uh, 22 had massive global headwinds. Those are all turning. You know, inflation is coming off. In fact, our view is that if the current uh, prices of commodities even sustain, we might look at inflation almost, uh, you know, zero or very, very low single digits uh, by April, May 23. And talking about the global inflation uh, interest rates uh, the pace of increase has already started to come off and again you know we concur with the view that towards the second half of 23 at least in us you will start to see interest rate cuts we are already seeing china reverse its uh, zero covid policy it's opening up and post this chinese new year holidays we expect the chinese economy to start moving up in jest and if other countries uh, uh, are uh, an, any indication, post the opening up of uh, COVID-related instructions, people go berserk. And Chinese are, you know, double berserk uh, expected to go. And therefore, we believe that post uh, this uh, opening up uh, uh, after the New Year holidays in China, will have massive, massive demand, uh, you know, coming up in China, which will aid the global growth scenario also. So from a global front, Obviously, the headwinds are turning into tailwinds. As far as India is concerned, I think we did not have a massive inflation problem. Yes, inflation did inch up and it is coming off a little bit. We did have interest rates go up, but not as sharply uh, as the world. And therefore, we will believe that in India, we will have a flattish kind of interest rate scenario. And uh, the opening up trade has already played out in India over the last 12-15 months. So, uh, you know, India continues to remain uh, what it was, which was a fairly uh, decently growing economy. We grew upwards of six, six point, uh, almost six and a half percent in 22. The IMF is projecting India uh, as the fastest growing large economy in 23 and 24. And if the world uh, starts to grow faster, which is what our base case assumption is, then India can grow at seven percent plus for the next two years. So global headwinds turning into tailwinds in India, it can only aid and India can inch up its growth from six and a half to seven percent. So to that extent, we are quite optimistic. Sure, sure. So I, uh, you know, totally believe in this optimism and uh, moving ahead uh, to Samit. Uh, Samit, you know, though uh, I agree with Samir and Sunil, with regards to uh, some of the headwinds turning into tailwinds and in India position to capitalize, but with regards to money, especially in the mid and small cap space, which is your area of focus. You know, I remember reading one report, 2019, where you had mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, mid and small caps operate in cycles of four years, whereby 2007 was a peak, then 11 was a peak, and then 14, and then 2017, and then 2021. So now in 2023, given the entire context and scenario, you know, some of the headwinds turning into tailwinds, where is the valuation of mid and small cap? And, you know, are you still believing that in that, you know, context, 2025 will be the next peak? Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, yes, come on. So, I mean, this is what, you know, has happened in the history. doesn't mean that it's going to repeat in the same, uh, you know, periods of cycles. Uh, you know, so, see, 85% of uh, fund money comes into the top 100 stocks. You know, so there is very little uh, liquidity available in the small and mid cap space. You know, and during times of uh, sort of euphoria, you know, even a few billion dollars coming more into the mid and small cap space, can uh, you know take up the the indices uh, pretty sharply, and then same thing happens you know when when uh, liquidity rise off and then you know people try to take money off and that's where the volatility in the mid and small cap space is much higher. And uh, I mean in each of the cycles, if you look at two thousand and seven, from there it fell by probably seventy percent, seventy five percent. From two thousand eleven again it halved, 
2017 again it halved you know so there are pretty sharp falls uh, in the mid and small cap space so it's you know uh, i know that uh, many would, would say that it's very it's it's not efficient enough to time the market but in the small and mid cap space you need to be very careful you know because if you get in at a wrong time at the peak of the cycle it takes years to uh, to recover uh, that kind of so uh, i mean given this kind of uh, history probably you know you're right uh, that you know we have had a peak in 2021 but uh, you know we also had such peak in 2014 15 where it, the markets didn't collapse but they uh, you know corrected in time you know it remained flat for a, for a while and again the you know cycle picked up so probably i think given the valuations you know valuations in the last uh, 18 months have have corrected a lot you know their indices may, may not show it but uh, most of the mid and small cap uh, stocks have corrected by 30 40% you know it's pretty normal i think the median would be in that uh, that kind of a uh, range the only difference this time around i think is that, that the balance sheets are very strong in the mid and small cap space which you know generally goes out for a toss uh, during during the uh, euphoric kind of cycle because everyone goes for these you know large investments and then delivers the balance sheet which hasn't happened uh, this time as well uh, cash flow generation has been pretty strong so if you look at uh, say last uh, year one one year september to september uh, in the top 100 stocks if you look at the cash flow from operation it's come down by almost 19% right the the p multiple has gone down but actually if you look at the enterprise value to cash flow from operation ratio it's actually gone up you know it used to be about 16 times now it's 22 times right so the quality of earnings probably has worsened a bit in the large cap space it hasn't happened in the same uh, sort of proportion in the small cap space. The cash flow from operation has gone down by 5%, right? but but uh, the index has corrected by probably 17, 18%. You know, that's been the, that's been the case. So I feel that, uh, uh, you know, we would have pretty good run for the small, small cap, given the, given the balance sheet, given the quality of earnings, and uh, most of the promoters are pretty prudent. They are going for investments uh, pretty careful. Uh, but as an invest investor, you know, it's a very vast space. You need to pick your spots. You know, the, uh, more likely if you just go blindly, you'll get most of the stocks wrong. You know, it's, it's not a, a space where you can just throw darts. You know, you have to be careful uh, and uh, pick your spots. So if you do that, I think it's a pretty attractive opportunity in that space. Sure, Samit, I think, you know, uh, given that a lot of investors have, uh, you know, put a lot of faith on your funds over last one decade and last 18 months have been tough. So obviously, you know, uh, the comfort that you have given and the data that you have thrown, obviously, you know, adds a lot of value and thank you for the same. So moving on to uh, Samir, Samir, you know, as I mentioned, you know, you are one of, one of the most experienced fund managers here. So I'm going to ask uh, you know, one tough question from you, which investors want me to ask, and that pertains to, uh, you know, the reduced alpha over years, you know, since your, uh, 30 years of experience, I'm sure you would have also seen, you know, in say early 2000, it was very, very evident that most of the funds, you know, mutual funds that one of time used to generate very high alpha, but over years that alpha is actually reducing and over last three years, you know, there are very rare funds, very few funds, which are actually generating alpha, be it in the large cap space, be it in multi cap space or within small cap space. So what is it, you know, why, what is the reason is the reason uh, for reduced alpha too much focus on bottom up, uh, you know, uh, approach and missing maybe, you know, macro uh, risks or macro changes that are happening too frequently in the global economy, or is there any other reason, you know, kindly give your wise opinion on this? aspect okay so the so the big picture is obviously the 90s and early 2000 were great times for example in 90s i beat the market by 30 percent per annum for eight years whereas over the last 20 years it has become like six seven percent per annum so the thing is that in the 90s a the index was behind uh, in the sense that the old companies were getting hit and new companies in tech and pharma and these Hero, Honda types, and Z, and all were getting listed, and it took too long 
for them to be included in the benchmark. Same thing happened in China, where the tech and the casinos were not listed and the PSU banks were listed and therefore the index in China has done badly, but many fund managers did well. Over the last five, seven years, there has been one difference, which is that these private equity guys came in and prevented companies to get listed early on in their life. So that the things that we could buy in the listed space at, you know, after three, four years of their uh, being founded, they would go public and then you could buy them six, nine months later at very reasonable valuation. But in a big picture sense, I don't think the mathematics changes. The mathematics is that all the fund managers together are the market. Therefore, they cannot all outperform. Therefore, some in theory, let us say 50% of the money should outperform and 50 should underperform, but then there is the cost. So because of the cost, some one, 2% cost, therefore 40% will outperform, let's say, instead of 50. Then the next question becomes that the same fund manager has to beat again and again for you to say that he's beaten over five years. So I have had more than 150 man years of uh, portfolio management experience in terms of years into number of funds. And maybe the one year track record is 70% and five year is near 100%. So the thing is that by design, all cannot outperform. So today there is a PMS which says I buy extreme value. So I buy beaten up PSU banks, I will buy Coal India, I will buy NTPC. And simultaneously, there is other PMS who says, I will buy only growth. And I don't even know that there is a thing called price. Now going in, the distributor and the fund investor should know that both cannot outperform over a short cycle, maybe over a long cycle, they can both outperform. So by definition, there will be underperformance of an extreme kind in one side. So that is the choice that the customer is making by going with a certain philosophy and a track record. But by design, one of them will have extreme underperformance and one will have extreme outperformance. But I give no credit to either of the two fund managers in those cases because it is the investor who's made the most difficult choice of choosing. I like my idea, Sunil's idea, some of these other diversified guys' idea who say, we will decide for you whether today we are going to buy value or today we are going to buy growth or we are going to buy both. Because if the biggest decision is, did you buy value? And then value underperformed and the fund manager will come back and say, what did I do wrong? I told you I will buy value. Did I buy a single growth stock? No. So how is it my fault? And the growth guy will say, today growth is out of favor. So what can I do? Did I buy a single NTPC share? No. So the decision is left to the investor. And that is how this business works. You find people who you, uh, whose theory you buy into and the cycle over which they sell it to you. And that is how it works. But in the end, there will always be uh, 30, 40% people who will outperform. And by definition, 60 will underperform because of the cost. But since the same guy will not always underperform and the same will not always outperform, uh, the investor will have to choose. But that I don't think means that you go into an ETF straight away because you have to see also that whether that ETF outperforms or even is in line with the index. In the offshore ETFs, which is the dollar denominated ETFs, they themselves underperform the index by one and a half, two percent per annum because of tracking error, because of capital gains, because of uh, their own cost and uh, whatever else. So index is a good thing. And over time, we all beat it. But looking at it, six months, nine months, 12 months, because there are extreme changes. Like last year, I saw underperform because the stock that I would never buy went up. Now it's a bet how much they can outperform because over 26 years, they have, I have done well by not buying those kind of shares. And then we see how it goes. Brilliant. I think, you know, this is a very uh, uh, holistic answer that you have given to this question. And I move on to uh, Sunil Ji. So uh, Sunil, you know, you are kind of known for alpha. In fact, if we open Abacus website, it, it is positioned around alpha. And obviously over last four years of history, you have maintained that. 
and we wish that it continues uh, in future. But given the current context, given the you know difficult times and uh, too much uh, you know macro changes happening, what are your opinion? You know how is Abacus going to continue delivering alpha over longer term? I think, uh, as Samir Bhai mentioned, I think we have all been in this game for a pretty long period of time. And uh, at some point of time, you know, the maturity and experience also helps. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, every portfolio manager will have some style and some preferences. And uh, all of them have done well over a reasonable period of time. So our view is that we should stick with what we believe in and what has worked for us. And to that extent, I think if you're able to do that, uh, you know, and reduce your mistakes and that reduction of mistakes also happens with time. You know, there's always a tuition fee you have to pay. So in the initial phase of your career, you end up paying higher tuition fees by making more mistakes. But as you go into your bachelor's and master's and then PhD, based on the year, your number of mistakes reduces. And I think that also helps in creating alpha. As far as uh, I think India is concerned, uh, you know, and our approach to it, see, we believe that India will continue to grow at a decent pace. And uh, obviously, the private sector in India will continue to grow faster than the economy. From our perspective at Abacus, we believe only in three things. Invest in profitable companies, invest where there is visible profit growth, and invest in companies what, where what you pay today will be made, made more than made up by way of future profitability. And to that extent, you know, we don't have loss making companies, at least companies which have no visible profits. And therefore, you know, uh, to some extent, uh, uh, 2021 and early 22, uh, we might have suffered a little bit because those companies kept on going up irrespective of the valuations and the, and the profits. But the second half has been phenomenally, uh, uh, you know, good because only those companies have performed. At the same time, you know, from time to time, you will keep on facing challenges. And frankly, the second half of 22 has been full of challenges for the corporate world. So at the uh, at the uh, in the Nifty level or the entire corporate level, uh, Indian corporates have grown profits, but a significant number of companies have seen massive uh, reduction in even their top line, and uh, definitely significant uh, impact on their margins out of huge in raw material prices. You know, it went up percent post. Russia Ukraine issue, a lot of raw materials, and then they fell also similarly. Similar has been the case with energy, and similar has been the case with uh, logistics cost. Um, and to that extent, you know, the swings in the, the uh, profitabilities and the prices in some of the smaller companies has been pretty large. But our view is that if you are able to create a portfolio where growth is uh, higher than uh, the uh, overall corporate growth with a significantly uh, I would say decent ROE uh, and uh, uh, you know valuations uh, we take care of by not uh, chasing momentum. Uh, I think that has worked at least for me for the last 25 years. Um, and uh, uh, there is uh, at this point of time no doubt in our mind that that should work uh, going forward. So at Abacus, I think the way our portfolios are structured, we have a lot of unique stocks. You know these are not the routine. Uh, fund stocks, uh, a lot of stocks internally researched. Our uh, thought process has been that when the markets are stable and going up, our stocks will do very well. And when the markets are challenging like what they were in 22, we should be in line with the market or slightly, it doesn't matter. And I think uh, it's the portfolio has uh, basically actually mirrored that. Uh, you know, so you you mentioned alpha. You know, happens two three years. You may be hugging the index, and then one year you create so much alpha that uh, you end up generating only thirty percent on a CAGR. So our mid and small cap fund, for example, since it's three and a half years uh, since inception, absolute returns are one hundred and eighty percent versus the benchmark, which is seventy percent. But in twenty two, it was like zero alpha. It's exactly in line with the benchmark. Uh, but twenty and twenty one were great years. So maybe, you know, you'll have one or two years where you are like flattish compared to the benchmark. But then, you know, when, when things normalize, uh, if your stock picks are good and you don't make too many mistakes, you'll definitely make mistakes, but you uh, don't make too many mistakes, then there is no reason uh, uh, to believe that this strategy should work. Sure, Sunil. I think, you know, again, 
very important question and uh, you know very meaningful answer and that is exactly you know how we had promised to our client so thank you to both of you sunil and samir moving on to samit you know because this question is important i will you know ask this question to you as well all the more because you know we uh, at pmsaf you know, do a lot of evaluation and you know we have proudly given awards to sage one you know in 2021 and 22 for your last 3 years 5 years and 10 years of performance and obviously we know that you know sage one has delivered true wealth creation you know over these years and your performance till may 2022 was actually very good but after that it has actually come it has fallen and that is where investors kind of you know want to ask this question on what have been your learnings and you know how do you promise the continued alpha in years to come i understand that you know last 6 8 months of underperformance is very short period but obviously you know investors are always wanting uh, more and more data comfort especially from the manager and since this is the right forum this is the question for you right <clears throat> well you're right i mean see in the last 11 years since you know we started uh, <laughs> we have had multiple periods of underperformance in 2016 2018 19 you know recently so and they are pretty you know pretty prolonged prolonged period of uh, uh, underperformance so this is you know i think part of the game of course every time it happens it's painful and uh, <clears throat> you know uh, question is you know if you have uh, gone wrong in something <clears throat> you got to be upfront correct those uh, correct those uh, mistakes and keep on evaluating you know if there is a reason for underperformance which is not because of you but because you know something else which doesn't fit into your strategy like what samir said you know if you are <clears throat> focusing on companies which are you know pretty high quality businesses <clears throat> run by you know good promoters return on equity is pretty high and you you're looking for uh, your value in, in those and during uh, last 7 8 months if uh, you know the kind of companies which have run up which is you know psu banks psu companies railway stocks you know adani stocks where it just uh, doesn't fit into your strategy you know you can't do anything about it right you, what you can do is of course you know have you stuck to your uh, uh, strategy uh, do you still have conviction in the portfolio and uh, you know you uh, accordingly make uh, make those changes and and move on so i mean in that respect we we keep on evaluating ourselves because each months of underperformance you know is painful not for just for investors but also for us you know because uh, you know every time it has happened it's it's it's, it's stressful right so what we did was uh, you know looked at uh, how the portfolio has done over the last uh, say 12 months as, as i said if you look at the you know top 100 stocks or even uh, the small cap uh, space the cash flow from operation for a lot of these companies have uh, gone down for <clears throat> top 100 it's gone down by 19% for small cap by 5% whereas if you look at our portfolio you know the cash flow from operation has gone up by 20% you know and then the earnings have gone up by even more you know so the trailing p multiple of the portfolio last year was about 30 times today it's at 21 times right one year forward multiple is 17 times and so that gives us a lot of uh, comfort wherever uh, you know portfolio companies maybe have disappointed and where we probably don't have the same conviction we have gotten out of those uh, kind of companies <clears throat> and made those changes you know so with the question is uh, you know are you comfortable with the portfolio you know the performance is something which is in the short run you know as warren buffett said it's a voting machine and in the long run it's a weighing scale and uh, in the long run i strongly believe that the performance will mirror or converge towards the earnings growth right and that's been the focus i mean earnings growth at a reasonable value you know it's not that you know we are uh, uh, we don't have any stock which would probably trade beyond you know 40 times or that kind of a multiple so i believe that given the strength of the portfolio which has return on capital of close to 28% at a median level right return on equity similar uh, level p multiple trailing multiple of Uh, you know 21 times enterprise value to cash flow operation is significantly lower than what is for the top uh, uh, 100 stocks or you know most of the universe uh, and where i believe that most of the companies will will be able to double their earnings if not in 3 years in 4 years and that's what we generally look for 
you know, I feel it's a, uh, and given our historical valuations, our historical valuations have ranged from 15 times to 35 times. Right? In that uh, context, it is, uh, compared to the last 11 years, it's uh, way, way, uh, you know, below the median valuation that we have traded at, you know, 21 times. And I, I believe that the growth, three-year growth or four-year growth looks much better than what I probably had seen in the last 11 years. You know, so I think that gives me a lot of confidence. Um, and, you know, again, it's in the mid and small cap space. So if you look at our small cap portfolio, which was launched four years back, uh, you know, it has tripled during that time period. And in each of the last 12 months, it has outperformed the small cap index. Right? And we have also stopped taking money because, I mean, we have said that we will raise only uh, 1,000 crores. Beyond that, we won't. And uh, because it's a very difficult universe where the liquidity is a big issue, and uh, very difficult to manage large uh, sums of uh, money. And so even though, you know, we find the portfolio attractive, we have stopped taking any money because we, uh, our size of fund is going to drag the performance uh, in the long run. Because I find, you know, when, when I want to find companies where I can invest 40, 50 crores in one, one stock, uh, the impact cost is getting bigger and bigger. You know that means it is definitely taking taking away from the from the returns. So getting in and getting out, you know, does have an impact impact cost. So, and you know that you know we are generally you know very cognizant of the returns. You know we are business comes uh, secondary, and that's where we have stopped uh, taking any any further for the money. It is only for the benefit of the investor. So we will do whatever it takes uh, because you know our passion is all to generate returns for me managing large AUM doesn't really make uh, you know uh, make much of a difference main thing is am I am I managing comfortable amount of AUM where I can deliver on what you know I have done in the past and that's what uh, you know we we continue to do sure Samit I think this is a pertinent point that you have made and thank you so much for the same so uh, again moving on to Samit Samit you know you are one of the most learned most educated and knowledgeable fund manager in my opinion. And that is why, you know, I'm asking this question to you with regards to investor behavior, you know, investors, in my opinion of last two decades of my experience, I've seen investors are mostly emotional in taking their decisions. I'll give you the context, you know, in 2020, mid of 2020, after having seen markets down by 30, 35, 40%, you know, investors, when they were selecting, investing into equity, they were always wanting to go with the performance fee option. You know, they, because in last 18 months, because of the correction, they had made no money. They, they were, they were of the view that we will pay to the fund manager only if fund manager delivers. And then after that, there was a, you know, huge rally and all those, PMSs, which had offered 0% fixed fee, 8% hurdle, and then 20% performance fee, you know, obviously added a lot of AUM. And then investors in those products, eventually after one year, paid 5 6% kind of fees because markets went up. Now, at this juncture, in 2023, over the last 18 months, markets have not performed much. Again, you know, investors are getting attracted towards those fee options, which are like 0% fixed fees and 8% hurdle and 20% performance fee, something like closer to that. So what do you want to advise, you know, to investors, uh, when they select, uh, you know, such fee options and kind of, you know, make such emotional decisions in this regards. I have never thought of it, but just big picture, I would think that uh, fee, of course, if it's the same fund manager, you can more easily evaluate whether you should go for fixed fee or performance fee because I would think that the thumb rule you should use is that you should expect that the fund will give 13-15% return. So at 15%, which one looks okay? Something like that. So if you say, I don't know what we said, zero fee and 8% hurdle, that means you will give 7% over 8 and on that 7, you are giving 20%. So 1.4 is what you should think and compare that with others. But the thing is that in this business, there are currently more than, I think, four, 500 PMSs. Does anybody believe that there are 500 managers in India with a track record, which is worthy of raising outside money? I don't think so. So what is happening is if a new guy comes and says, I will take no fee, it is not charity. He's buying, you're gifting him an option. He will say, I will buy 10 stocks on which I have done this research. 
and then if those 10 stocks go up or five stocks go up because anyway in general stocks go up and mostly the market goes up more than 8% you are just giving him a free option so any new guy will come and do this thing it is like i should tell you a story that there was a guy in delhi who told me that his uh, friend wanted him to get him admission into a school in uh, delhi and this guy said it'll cost him 5 lakh rupees but you leave this 5 lakhs in that corner of my office i will try to get you admission and tell your son to work hard and to prepare for the exam properly and if i can't get you the admission i will return you the money and the money kept lying there this guy did nothing that fellow could not get admission on his own so he said your money is lying there you can take it back but if that guy with a 20% probability had got admission into the school this guy would have gone away with your 5 lakh rupees saying i got it done so this idea that zero fee it should be zero fee of the same guy who otherwise deserves some money from you but in general as a big picture thumb rule i would say you can take if you so desire a 14 15% expected return and do it but separately fee alone is not enough because i don't think that 500 people are there maybe there are 100 because they have to have in their prior something a track record either doing it for 5 7 years or from a mutual fund but you can't randomly come and say i have this theory you have to do it with your friends and family for 7 years otherwise zero fee and an upside is i think just an option free option that you are giving to the manager brilliant moving on to sunil uh, you know uh, we have last 5 minutes so i will have to cover two more questions so i remember in 2019 abacus under your thought leadership had come up with a very pertinent report bubble in quality and at that point of time you know that report had become very popular over last 3 years we have seen you know that bubble gradually has been kind of bursting and uh, environment has been becoming more and more value conscious though the markets have in my opinion over last two decades uh, idly should have been value conscious but in last 5 7 10 years markets were not value conscious but you know the bubble in quality report i think came at a right time and after that it has been kind of gradually bursting now at this juncture what's your strategy and how do you see that quality that growth uh, you know uh, i would say universe of stocks is the burst in bubble done or you know you see that it's the beginning and maybe that underperformance will continue no so i think the genesis of of uh, putting the thoughts to paper was the fact that uh, you know one is this perception about quality and growth is a perception which is in your minds you know uh, uh, if you actually go to oxford and just uh, uh, see the definition of growth or if you go on to any investment website and see the definition of growth stock growth stocks are stocks which should grow significantly higher than the underlying gdp growth uh, most of the so called growth stocks are not even growing in line with the nominal gdp growth of india so the whole fallacy that their growth stocks itself is questionable second is you know um, uh, you ask anyone uh, of the of the uh, of the who can ask them what is the growth rate of these stocks they will say 20% 25% uh, without even going into the detail but when you go inside uh, the details you find that almost all of them have grown you know either lower than the gdp growth nominal gdp growth or just in line with the gdp growth in fact last 3 4 years they've been growing at like 2 3% third is you know to just believe that uh, you buy anything at any price and you'll end up making money then you don't need uh, the pms af world you don't need any of us you know you just buy 10 stocks which are the best stocks irrespective of the price and go to uh, go to spain or paris and have a holiday there i think this whole thing also had uh, uh, some kind of a history when you look at the us where there were nifty 50 stocks in the late 70s and early 80s trading at 50 70 p multiples and for 20 years they gave more return not because they were not great stocks but they were priced beyond perfection so i am of the old school thought i always believe that the best stock is not the best company is not necessarily the best stock and you know to put it in uh, perspective you know if you buy an 80 90 p stock which grows at 10% to even generate 10% return the stock will have to trade at an 80 90 p all its life uh, and that has never happened anywhere in the world in fact in us for the last 20 years if you see there are only five stocks which have traded at a p multiple of more than 50 for more than 5 years 
in india there are hundred stocks you know the chappal stocks and so many other stocks where there is no more they trading at like 100 130 150 pp multiples and degrowing in profit for the last 3 4 years so i would say that there is a long way to go there will either be a massive time correction which has happened in companies like itc and hindustan lever and colgate and you know whirlpool and gillet for so long or there will be price correction or there will be combination of both so last one one and a half years there has been a combination of both uh, going forward also unless growth picks up and you know we are not now a economy where uh, there is too much of under penetration 95% of the people brush their teeth two times a day you know so now for you to grow in that segment we will all have to start brushing our teeth three times a day you already have such a huge market uh, share you know and the same is the case with others the other thing is now with this b2c brands coming up competition is coming up in a major way and they will eat up into uh, the existing uh, players market share you know be it paints or be it anything else so i think one has to be uh, 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 a little bit careful you know i'm working on the the follow up on that unfortunately you are so busy day in and day out and this quarterly earning season is so killing uh, you hardly get peaceful time to you know put your thoughts to paper but i i would say that uh, uh, there is still uh, room uh, for either a price correction or a time correction of both George, i think this is a piece of information for all those investors who are heavily invested in some of these moted and high quality businesses thank you so much for your insights uh, i move on to my last question to samit you know uh, in your last 5 to 7 to 10 years of you know performance i have seen uh, specialty chemicals and specialty pharma is one sector you know which has actually added a lot of uh, i would say returns for your clients especially in the last cycle now in this cycle one sector you know if you have to kind of anticipate which will lead the mid and small cap space or maybe two sectors if you want to talk about what's your view generally you know we're always a uh, little careful when you know you try to predict sort of the macro you know what are the sectors because stock market uh, is extremely dynamic the industries are dynamic i'll give an example you know what happened in the chemical sector right i mean <clears throat> after covid suddenly there were disruptions in the supply chain there were short term demand and then uh, the many companies went up piling up their stock uh, you know inventory and uh, that led to significant increase in the profitability of a lot of chemical companies right and what that has done is that it has given a lot of confidence of uh, going for expansion you know in the last 2 uh, to 3 years and suddenly now you see that you know uh, the industry is full of uh, capacity and the demand has suddenly uh, come down and there is a huge uh, compression of uh, margins right so long term story of chemical specialty chemical pharma do you know it remains but question is investor you need to be very careful about the dynamics you know how it how it plays plays out right because it's uh, the stock market itself people pile up and they you know come in herds and that's what happened in the chemical space that in the stock people came in in herds and that to at the peak margin peak profit and peak p multiple right so of course uh, you need one needs to make sure that you exit also at the right right time because that combination of peak margin peak profit and peak p multiple is, is extremely dangerous now going forward i mean you know i can obviously rationalize saying that you know india is going to need you know building of infrastructure there is going to be a capex boom india is focusing on you know manufacturing there is no question because the need of the hour is that we need to create employment where is the employment going to come from it's going to come from either from tourism for which you will need infrastructure to be built because that's sort of a prerequisite you would need uh, if you are focusing on manufacturing you will need to build factories you need to build uh, data centers warehouses so no question about it that you know you there will be demand for building materials but question is as an investor you need to look at all these factors you know it's easily possible that uh, the supply can be much bigger than the demand so supply side is extremely important when you evaluate an investment uh, side and that's where a lot of things like barriers to entry and uh, you know those kind of things uh, which everyone talks about comes into picture so you need to pick your right pockets where such uh, you know herd is not there where the p multiples are reasonable and the margins are also reasonable higher the margins it will attract lot of 
industry participants to come into those uh, businesses and the capacity automatically goes up. So it is very dynamic. So even though macro wise, I feel this is a theme which which works out, you need to find pockets because you know uh, you can get into uh, cement, you can go into steel, you can get into stainless steel, you can go into minerals, mining, you can go into electrical pipes, you can go into optical fiber, you can go into uh, you know structural steel tubes, there are so many ways of playing it you know it's all bottoms up that you need to uh, you need to pick and again you need to be uh, ready that the theme may be lasting for uh, 10 years but that could be only at a fundamental level for investors that can only last for two three years because very quickly and things get priced in very very quickly so uh, very i think uh, investor view of looking at things can be very different than fundamental way of looking at things so you know accordingly one has to be uh, careful sure thank you Samit, and thank you everyone you know for your time today i think all these uh, views opinions have been quite insightful and quite uh, you know uh, meaningful and to all the viewers i would just like to sum it up by saying keep the faith alpha will happen and we at PMS World have given you some of the best funds. We are very cautious with our quality, risk, and consistency approach. You know, when we select a fund manager for you, so uh, ultimately, you know, believe in the fact that in long term, wealth has to be created in equities and asset class. India is a golden bird, and we are going to see the resurgence of this golden bird in this decade. Thank you, everyone, and over to you, Akriti. Thank you. Well, you know what? I think this was the perfect start of our day too. What a power-packed session. What a power-packed discussion. And there was so much to learn here. Thank you so much, Mr. Manocha and all of our panelists.